that fair? No, go for it. Okay. All right, so the object of the resolution are five different parts of executive power. We went over them already, but first is first use nuclear weapons, two is trade, uh, three is treaties, four is war, and five is surveillance. So try to uh, know that uh, like the back of your hand so that you, know, um, you can more easily dwell on this topic and think through uh, what all these different components are. Um, and yeah, there'll be different ways in which we engage it from a critical level, um, but we're about to engage in each of the first topics uh, specifically. So uh, the first one, first nuclear use. Uh, so what is this? Uh, it is the policy of the United States that when the United States wants to shoot a nuclear weapon at another country, either preemptively or first, uh, that they reserve the right to do that. Um, that we do not need to wait for someone to strike us with a nuclear weapon before we strike them. Uh, most countries have the agreement that you should not uh, strike first because that could instigate a nuclear war. The United States has reserved the right to maintain first use nuclear strike uh, according to their policies until there are no more nuclear weapons. <laughs> kind of funny, right? Uh, we need to have our nuclear weapons until we don't have them anymore. Um, so uh, the first link. Uh, so <laughs> nuclear war is premised on this idea of the prisoner's dilemma. Does anybody know the prisoner's dilemma? All right, let's say both of you are, there are two people and you got caught for a crime uh, and the police keep you in an interrogation room. And here are the different options you can have. So uh, let's say A is, who wants to be A? Isaiah is A, who wants to be B? All right, Isaiah and Yardley. Um, so if both of you, if both of you stay quiet and you don't, um, snitch on each other, then both of you will serve just one year. If but if you snitch on the other person, then you get to go free, but the other person gets three years. Uh, same thing on the other side. If you betray the other person, you get set free, no jail time, but the person that you snitched on gets three years. Um, however, if you both snitch on each other, then you both get two years. So which one would you do? You would not snitch, right? Yeah. Um, but you wouldn't snitch? No, I would do But then the question is, what if they, what, you, do you say you would or would not snitch? No, I said no, I would not. You would not snitch, right? Uh, but then what's the guarantee that stops the other person from snitching on you? If you don't snitch, you can get three years. I trust. Yeah, I <laughs> trust, I, right? Yeah, it's like, what else can I do in that situation? <laughs> Fair, okay. <laughs> yeah, debate, we're family. Okay, so. The reason why the prisoner's dilemma is relevant to this topic is that is the similar scenario in which we are in a nuclear, when it comes to nuclear weapons, right? Um, if you try to get rid of nuclear weapons, if you get all rid of your nuclear weapons, what's the guarantee that the other party will get rid of their nuclear weapons? And if you end up getting rid of your nuclear weapons and they keep all their nuclear weapons, then all of a sudden you're at a huge disadvantage in a war and they could conquer you, and colonize you, etc. So right now, the reason as to why it's hard to get rid of nuclear weapons is because of the concept of the prisoner's dilemma. Does that make sense? Uh, if you snitch on each other, then y'all can get free and we can live in a world of peace, right? Um, but there's no guarantee the other party will abide by those rules. Um, so uh, the first use policy was last um, declared on in 2010 by not National Public Radio, I don't know what NPR stands for. Um, I think it's called the <laughs> Nuclear Policy Review. Uh, sorry. Uh, the and the nuclear policy review. Uh, let's see if this opens up. Uh, makes certain has a series of um, policies that the United States adheres to as far as nuclear policies. Um, the one that is relevant for this topic. Um, so it one they want to get rid of nuclear proliferation and terrorism. Um, but the the caveat to that is they need to reinforce strategic stability, uh, which includes having a first use policy. Uh, the idea is that if you keep a nuclear first a nuclear first use policy, you're able to deter anyone else from trying to attack you. Right? It's more of a psychological thing than anything else. Because eventually, the funny thing about the nuclear about the Cold War was that you can't really build a bomb big enough to like destroy the entire world because then you can't wager that to um, you can't wager that to scare your opponent because you don't want to build a bomb that would destroy everyone because then nobody you can't negotiate your terms. <laughs> Um, but if you, you only want to build bonds big enough to destroy a whole city, so then you can threaten their cities, if you will. Does that make sense? So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, we, the cycle, nuclear war is often more psychological than it is uh, physical. 
That's why game theory and nuclear war are so tied together. So what exactly are the harms of nuclear force use? Um, I'm gonna show a quick five minute video. This may look like a car, but it's not a car. Because we don't make it just car. I'm gonna mute the, <laughs> mute the capitalist propaganda. Was that high theory right there? Yeah. <laughs> they look like cars. Wow. Not a car. <laughs> <laughs> I know, Bojo is right. Postmodernism. I mean, I'm like a simulation of all the time. Yeah. <laughs> look at your name. Like, where to put this since the dawn of the nuclear age of the 1940s, global stability has rested on a certain set of assumptions. Most of the world's nuclear capability was split between the U.S. and Russia, and the umbrella of American protection meant that its allies didn't have to develop nukes of their own. That appears to be changing. President Trump has famously been less hawkish about standing up to Russia. Now the European Union is reportedly considering a nuclear deterrent of its own and sharing France's weapons between member countries. The situation in Asia is even more unsettled. North Korea is fanatically pursuing its own arsenal of nuclear-tipped ballistic missiles. On Monday, it test-launched four of the rockets into the ocean, just 200 miles shy of Japan. And the American president has unconventional ideas about how Japan should prepare. North Korea has no. Japan has a problem with that. I mean, they have a big problem with it. Maybe they would, in fact, be better off if they defend themselves from North Korea. Maybe with they would be better off, including with nukes, yes. All of this has experts worried about an era of renewed nuclear threat, from jittery states and rogue actors who might seize on the instability. Among those sounding the alarm is William Perry, who served as Secretary of Defense under President Clinton. Perry was most of his life watching the world prepare for nuclear war, and he thinks we aren't nearly as scared as we should be. I think the professionals in the field have a pretty good understanding of the impact of the use of nuclear weapons, but the general public certainly does not, and many of our leaders do not. Perry's 89 years old. He lectures at Stanford, launched an online seminar last year, and travels the world two or three months a year to talk about how close we've come to catastrophe and how close we still are. He often talks about his nightmare scenario, where a small amount of enriched uranium ends up in the hands of a terrorist group. If they had maybe 40 kilograms, they could make an improvised nuclear bomb. But what would be the consequences? The consequences of a 15 kiloton bomb would be Hiroshima. And besides the 80,000, 100,000 casualties, the, the social, the political, and the economic consequences, <laughs> which is just really hard to believe. How realistic is this, though? Isn't this just some sci-fi fantasy fear? I think of all of the nuclear catastrophes that could happen, this is the most probable. I think, I would say, it's probably an even chance this will happen sometime in the next 10 years. An even chance? Even chance. Sometime in the next 10 years. You may desperately want to dismiss Perry as an alarmist, but he's a renowned expert, often called upon by world leaders. <laughs> I met him in Mexico like City, where he was attending the celebration of a 50-year-old nuclear ban treaty and running a closed-door planning meeting for top nuclear proliferation experts from around the world, known as the Group of Eminent... That's actually all you can see for now. If you want to watch the rest later, it's available on the message. Um, so yeah, those are the general concerns about a nuclear war, that it is it causes runaway violence that can't be reversed. Um, but specifically on um, the issue of terrorism, the United States also says that the U.S. reserves the right to preemptively attack if they know that a terrorist organization is also planning a nuclear strike, right? So if they, we find out that terrorists in Iran are developing a nuclear bomb, then we reserve the right to use a nuclear bomb to bomb Iran. That'd be as easy. So uh, what are the plans that we can do to try to resolve this issue? Oh. <laughs> So <laughs> the issue is, the, or the salience of this issue has to do with the president, uh, specifically Donald Trump, uh, i.e. the psychology of the president and whether the president should be trusted with these powers. Um, this isn't just a question of President Trump, however, because Trump is not the worst case scenario that we might get. We could get someone worse than Trump. And so maybe we shouldn't, Trump is a lesson for why we shouldn't give an individual this much power, because they could act erratically, they could act um, in ways that are not 
in the interests of people and lead to nuclear war among us all. So, fire and fury. <laughs> Who the fuck says that? Anyways. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so right now, there are lawmakers currently trying to um, curtail Trump's access to nuclear strike ability um, because they are afraid that Trump would be, would be able to act as a rogue agent with the government and, you know, cause a nuclear war. Okay, um, the general theories that uh, no first use theory addresses is one security studies and a little bit of just war theory. Uh, security studies is the study of national security, how to keep uh, nation states safe from terrorism, from wars, etc. Um, and then just war theory is what are the ethics in conducting a war? You know, like for example, that we in the, Gen the Geneva Convention says that we're not allowed to torture people, that we get prisoners of wars, that we're not allowed to um, starve them, etc. Uh, so one of the aspects of just war theories that would be debated on is, is it just to have a nuclear to have a first use nuclear strike or not? Um, a lot of neg a lot of affirmative teams will say that this is a violation of just war theory, and that's why uh, this is and this sets a particular precedent for international politics. Uh, whereas the negative might say something like, "No, first nuclear first use is just and is a part of just war theory in the way that we conduct uh, conflict and violence." So, questions about per nuclear first use? Cool. We got. We got Huh? Yeah, uh, yeah, mutual assured destruction for sure. Um, does anybody know what mutual assured destruction is? Uh, what is mutual assured destruction? Uh, oh, yeah, anybody? Well, like during the Cold War, um, during the time when this basically the same situation, like the that that concept started to grow out out of some congressman, I think. So, like he gave a speech where he gave that where he used that term, basically saying that. Like, if if we go to nu if nuclear war happens, then it's assured that we're both probably all going to put in there. Good. So when nuclear war happens, both sides are the losers in that conflict, and that itself is what is preventing countries from going to nuclear war with each other because there are no winners uh, post nuclear war. Um, what's you the Albert? Yeah. Uh, what's the Albert Einstein quote that like, you know it? Anyway, it's, it's something like the third world war will be fought with nuclear bombs, the fourth world war would be fought with sticks and stones. Yeah. <laughs> something like we wouldn't have a civilization post the third world, the world war. Um, okay, trade policies. So congressionally delegated trade powers. Um, the right now the United or the United States trade policies. Um, here's a quick infograph of the oh wait, no, it's not an infograph at all. <laughs> um, that is a trade, that's an example of a trade deficit. <laughs> right now, the United States is in a, well, I, can, I may as well just show that. But <laughs> the United States is right now what we consider a trade deficit, meaning that we um, import more goods than we export. Um, and the idea is that um, we, if you are in a trade deficit, then you are on the losing side of trade. Um, that's not particularly true, even among free market fundamentalists, because you can have the least less imports and, or no, you can have like more imports and less exports, and you can still be economically productive. Like, yeah, isn't that what capitalism is all about? Yeah, it's supposed yeah. To be potential. yeah, exactly. So that's why Trump's economic policies that aren't super coherent, all, not coherent, but consistent all the time. Yeah, um, as in his sometimes his trade policies are very nationalist, but his like economic policies, his domestic economic policies are uh, tend to be more um, free market. Uh, however, there is actually a reason or for how this they work together in this article. Uh, some of these examples will show you how they interact. So here's just a quick map of US trade policies or partners around the world. Uh, we most biggest trading partners are our neighbors, Mexico and Canada, um, but we also have a huge trade, huge trade, manufacturing trade with China, uh, five in the 500 billion area. Um, so right now uh, we are in the midst of a trade war between the United States and China. Uh, the way this works is that Trump will increase tariffs, meaning taxes on uh, uh, products that are being imported into the United States. And then in return, China will then tax products that are being uh, imported from the United States. Uh, the reason as to why Trump is creating a trade war right now, there is actually two reasons. One is the trade deficit. Trump doesn't want to be on the losing end of a trade deficit. Um, but two, uh, Trump also wants to make it so that more American products are being made in the United States, uh, i.e. more manufacturing in the United States, instead of getting our manufacturing from Chinese products. Um, so 
uh, that is where his, his economic policies actually make sense with his domestic policies. I, he wants free market within the United States, but then he also uh, doesn't want um, production to be coming from elsewhere. He wants all the production to be created in the United States. So that's actually how like a lot of authoritarian economic policies work. Yeah, but right now, um, oh yeah, so the harm, or help is the harm, but uh, one of the harms of doing trade, having a trade war is that when you tax a bunch of products from other countries, this actually makes it so, one, your the consumers lose, meaning that the things that you have to buy for certain products will be more expensive. So I know that right now, like cheese in China is like getting, taking a big hit because like, <laughs> they get a lot of their cheese from the United States. It's, it's really random and awkward, or no, random about which products are affected by this. Um, so consumers lose out. Um, businesses lose out and businesses in China lose out because then they can't export their products to the United States as much or it's more expensive. And then three, um, U.S. companies will lose out because then uh, ch they are affected by China's retaliation against U.S. products. So, for example, Harley Davidson uh, said that they had to move a bunch of uh, some of their factories from the United States to Europe in order to make up for the trade wars. Yeah, it's just kind of fun. It happened like a day or two after, right? Yeah, and pretty, pretty recent. Well, like a week, no, like right after. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, so yeah, the uh, effects of these, like, here's like some examples of products that will be affected. Let me think. This article has like a list of products that are affected by it. I don't know if I could find. Oh yeah, so Apple is one of the products, so computer products. Um, steel is one of them too. Oh yeah, and he's not just doing trade wars with China, he's doing trade wars with Europe, Canada, and Mexico. So. Um, there's a lot of different situations with it. Uh, if I was running an app on this topic, I would definitely, like an Orientalism app on trade wars would actually be a pretty relevant topic, i.e. the um, Orientalizing of China as a threat is what uh, informs a lot of Trump's trade policies, um, but also against other countries too. So questions about trade. All right, cool. Treaties. Um, so. Right now, the, the third part of the resolution says that we need to exit, or that we should prevent the executive from exiting from congressional executive agreements and Article 2 treaties. Article, Article 2 treaties are treaties that were also approved by the Senate. Um, and so the two common treaties that Trump is, that Trump got rid of, and um, people are trying to, yeah, and that people are trying to or criticizing him over is one, the Iran nuclear deal, and two, the Paris climate agreement. Uh, those will likely be the two main apps on this topic. Uh, you'll have one about Iran nuclear deal and how that will empower, not empower, but that will um, incentivize Iran to get nuclear weapons, which will create instability in the Middle East, or the Paris climate agreement, which is a step in the right direction towards resolving climate change. So, Cheers from Iran. Introduction on the Iran deal and what that looks like. Just emerged from months of negotiations in Austria and Switzerland to announce that, believe it or not, they have an Iran nuclear deal. Every pathway to a nuclear weapon is cut off. But what does that actually mean? How does all that actually work? Well, this gets technical really fast, but it helps if you go through with some of the most important issues. One of the big ones is uranium. That's the stuff. Dig it out of the ground, use it for nuclear fuel, for a power plant, or even for a bomb. The deal requires Iran to give up 97% of its enriched uranium, almost all of it, down to just a 300 kilogram stockpile, not very much. Uranium comes in different levels of enrichment. And this restriction is really severe. Iran is only allowed to have its uranium up to 3.67%. Enrichment. And to give you a sense of what that means, medical research grade uranium is enriched to 20%, and weapons grade uranium is enriched to 90%. So Iran's uranium is going to be way down at 3.67%, very safe and energy grade, and not something that is anywhere near what can be used for a nuclear weapon. Iran is going to give up most of its centrifuges. It's going to go from 20,000 centrifuges to just 5,000 that are spinning fissile material plus another 1,000 that it can use for uh, research and development that can use this material. And if Iran decided one day, you know what, we don't like this deal anymore, we're going to build a bomb, it would take it a really long time to do it. And that gets to another really important issue, and that's inspections. 
inspections and monitoring are how we make sure that Iran is sticking to their end of the deal and that they're not cheating. The inspections that the U.S. got out of this deal are frankly just astonishing. A one arms control analyst said he thought there was, quote, almost a 100% chance that if Iran cheated, it would be caught by these inspections. That's how good they are. So what does Iran get for accepting all of this? What Iran gets is relief from economic sanctions that have been just crippling its economy. But what these sanctions do is they cut off Iran's economy from the outside world. They cut it off from international banking, international finance. These have been just devastating Iran's economy. They are really desperate to get out from under these. And this is a big deal, not just for Iran the state, but for the 77 million people of Iran who is a big middle class and they've been suffering under economic sanctions for too long. And they will finally get to have a chance of having a real economy, hopefully very soon after this. A real economy. Just kidding. Um, so uh, the reason uh, if we, why the getting out of the Iran deal was stupid uh, was because, one, this means that the United States is no longer a trusted actor on the international stage, that we will make deals and then we will elect someone else and then they will retract those deals. Um, two, the, this will only incentivize other countries to get nuclear weapons, right? Because what's the incentive for a small country like Iran to get a nuclear weapon? It's to prevent the United States or guarantees that the United States won't try to invade them. What happened to Iraq, who did not have nuclear weapons? We invaded them, right? Uh, over weapons and mass destructions, <laughs> actually. Uh, and that's why, for example, North Korea uh, is also wants to get a nuclear weapon because they want to defend their interests from U US uh, military policies and policies from like Japan and South Korea. Uh, so, but if you get out of this deal, then we are all, all unable to negotiate with North Korea anymore because North Korea is no longer going to trust us. They're going to say that, well, you went back on the Iran deal, so there's no reason why we should make a deal with the United States. So that's why North Korea should get nuclear weapons. Um, and you see what the cascading effect that this happens. This will, this will incentivize a whole bunch of other countries who don't have nuclear weapons uh, to now proliferate even more and create conditions in which nuclear war is more likely to happen. Or uh, specifically, nuclear terrorism could happen, too, because there's more availability of re nuclear resources. Um, the, so the other issue of treaties that uh, affects or that Trump is affecting is the Paris climate deal. Um, so the United States is, yeah, the only country to get out of that deal. Um, not, it's not uncommon for the United States to not do and to not deal with climate change. Uh, for example, the United States was not a member of the Kyoto Co Protocol for the longest time. Um, and the Kyoto, Kyoto Protocol was also an international agreement with a bunch of nations to try to protect the environment and stop climate change. And yeah, the United States was never part of it, partly because uh, we are bought off by energy industries that uh, require oil and gas in order to um, oil and gas in order to maintain our economic um, growth at the moment. Um, so, what is inside the Paris Agreement? So, here are the main ones: um, to keep the temperature well below two degrees Celsius, um, to try to limit the increase to only one point five, um, and then the one that will keep the agreement ongoing is that every five years they will meet together to try to uh, set more more standards or to set better standards. So, <laughs> yeah, as, as um, so the the funny thing about the Paris Climate Agreement is that it was pretty like milk toast as far as agreements goes. It wasn't like the necessary conditions we need to definitely stop climate change. It was like the first baby steps so that we can create better deals later on. Um, yeah, the Trump administration was like, no. Um, and, uh, we're, so, the, by the way, their response to the, the Trump administration's response to both the Iran deal and the Paris Climate Change Agreement was like, both of these deals rip off the United States, so we're going to cancel this deal so we can renegotiate for another one. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, obviously, they're not going to renegotiate for another one. That's just there as possible deniability. But the fact is, they don't really like those agreements. All right, so war powers. So what exactly are war powers? Uh, when you see the word judicial deference, uh, judi judicial deference is when the courts uh, allow the government to do um, actions if it's in the name of national security. So as in the courts will not try to restrict the government's actions uh, if it's done for national security reasons. So one of the most famous acts of judicial deference was during the internment of Japanese, uh, Japanese populations in the United States, including Japanese citizens. 
uh, the Supreme Court released a 6-3 decision that says that the United States is allowed to intern Japanese uh, citizens and uh, residents uh, if it is under the name of national security. It's only been recently, actually. Um, the, uh, a court case, in, the Supreme Court, when trying to reach a decision on the Muslim ban, actually said that the, the Korematsu case was like bad and that we don't stand by the Korematsu case anymore, which is the case that let Japanese people be interned. So yeah, that's the thing. Basically that you're not allowed to intern people based on their race or their national origin. So who does this affect today? Um, so these are examples of wars that have been declared by, or that are being, that are, sorry, these are examples of wars that are being waged by the United States that does not have congressional oversight, really. Uh, i.e. Congress gave the executive branch some pass in order to uh, enact some uh, wars outside of the United States, such as here, Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and which leads to other policies like uh, torture, for example, the torturing of people in prisons, uh, or in this case, the development of homeland security, uh, which in itself includes the creation of ICE. So those are the two main areas of the topic as far as war powers goes. Um, so that's just an example of like drone strikes in Pakistan and how that affects uh, like the numbers of people who die. For example, children getting killed, 172. Uh, civilians getting killed, 421 from drone strikes in Pakistan. Um, so yeah, it also affects like executive war powers uh, within the way we <laughs> within the way that we conduct war. Uh, so yeah, the two main topics that will be addressed here. One, we currently allow for the internment of suspected terrorists uh, and uh, indefinitely. So imagine that just being taken away from where you live and being put in prison for like 10 years and not being told why you're there. It's just fucking absurd. Um, and then the, the other uh, concern is the separation of children from their parents, but also the detention of undocumented immigrants by ICE. So you might see a lot of affirmatives that maybe not the plan, the plan might not be about abolishing ICE, but the advantage might include about abolishing ICE because it would stop the executive branch from being able to use that particular department. That makes sense? All right. And lastly, five, surveillance. Uh, bulk incidental collection of all or nearly all foreign intelligence information on the United States persons without a warrant. So bulk incidental collection um, is the a case of the United States collecting metadata on everyone else. So metadata is when you just collect all the information on people without um, highlighting who they are. So you just get like, here's the contents of this conversation without like saying like this belongs to X person's pro Facebook profile. The reason as to why that was seen as a more effective way to combat terrorism was so that you can just literally like control F terrorists, you know, in the metadata system and you'll find out who's talking about terrorism and who's like saying things that are a threat to the government or a threat to people. Uh, so the different types of Oh yeah, so here is a video about the NSA and what it is. Now that nearly all of us are online, connected, or digital in some way, spies are no longer watching just one or two bad guys. Instead, the UK and US governments are both collecting massive amounts of information from the things we do on our phones and over the internet. There are two main ways they get hold of this information. One way is working with the companies that run these systems and tap the cables that are vital for moving all this information around. They can then sift through the huge amount of data they gather and all the messages that are there and store them in massive computer databases. Their other technique involves using their relationships with technology companies to get hold of things like emails, messages, or other information straight from their US servers. The spy agencies do throw away most of the content they collect. They keep that on their systems for about three days, then discard everything that's not from one of their targets. Metadata, though, who sent a message, who it was to, when it was sent, and more, is a different matter. The agencies keep almost all the metadata they see for around a month in the UK and up to a year in the US. That lets them build up profiles of millions of people, 
who talks to who, who knows who, and where people are if need be. These revelations pose many questions. What is the balance between our right to privacy and the authorities' duty to protect us? Governments in America and the UK argue that these surveillance programs help keep us safe from terrorism. But what happens if you're wrongly accused? And should we just accept that the internet is now a different place, run by businesses and governments who can monitor it how they want? Now that you know you're being watched, how does that change your behaviour, how you talk to your friends, and how much you trust the world around you? These revelations have changed the internet for us forever. Does privacy have a future online at all? That was cute. It was. I like the design. Yeah, it was really sharp. Okay. Anyway, so why is a surveillance state bad? <laughs> uh, Michel Foucault has this concept called the panopticon. Uh, it's Latin for the all-seeing eye. If anybody has a one dollar bill, uh, I have a one dollar bill. The back of the one dollar bill, you see the pyramid with the eye on it? Yes? Yeah. That's the all-seeing eye, the panopticon. Illuminati, yes, Illuminati. Um, so, <laughs> So yeah, there are literally a cabal, a secret or a cabal of people listening on their phone conversations, <laughs> and it's not a conspiracy. It's real. Uh, so the panopticon, the idea of the panopticon is a prison in which very in the center you have a tower uh, which guards can watch everyone, and then all along the walls are the prison cells. Uh, this is an idea that was that was forwarded by Jeremy Bentham, the guy who invented utilitarianism, and he says that this is the most efficient way to uh, construct a prison system. Uh, Michel Foucault criticized this notion, uh, but also extended the analysis that it turns out the best way in which you can control mass populations of people, i.e. prisoners, or in this case, citizens, uh, is to be able to have mass surveillance on those individuals. Uh, and that mass surveillance on individuals makes it so that people will self-discipline themselves into being docile bodies or servile to the state. He uh, uses this term docile bodies, meaning bodies that do not resist the government or bodies that conform, assimilate, etc. cetera. Uh, the, I have one more thing, I forgot what I was gonna say on that. Oh well. Yeah, so a lot of affirmatives on this, on this particular app, uh, more liberal affirmatives will talk about democracy and how we should have privacy rights and violation of the Fourth Amendment, et cetera. Um, but more conservative affirmatives, or at least conservatives as far as like nuclear war extinction impacts. Uh, there's an app called Zero Days. Did you maybe hear debate the surveillance topic? Yeah. What's do you know the Zero Days app? I vaguely remember. Okay, the Zero Days app is basically about how the U.S. government will break into a private server of another company using a loophole, and oh, then yeah. we'll use that to survey them, mm -hmm. and then they won't tell the company about it. Uh, but then that creates holes for computer hackers to hack into those yeah, private companies. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, those computer companies like lose all their finances, et cetera. So you can actually get a lot of like economic impacts from uh, NSA. Yeah, it's a weird, it's a weird app. It was like well, actually one of the apps, the harder apps to answer because like the concept was such a weird uh, one to get wrap your mind around. All right. So any questions on any of the other topics? What kind of apps could be run? What the advantages are? Weird apps that you might have thought of. All right. Cool. So um, let's see. Should we take a break? I feel like. Yeah, do you all need a break? Yeah. Okay, uh, five minutes? Yeah. Right. Ten? Okay, ten minutes. Yeah.